Looking for a TeamViewer alternative for a remote desktop that you can self-host? Well, Rust Desk is just that, a self-hostable, open-source, cross-platform application that allows you to remotely control other systems. In this video, I'm going to show you how to set up a self-hosted instance in Docker, and we'll talk about some security considerations as well, so let's get started. Are you an individual or forward-thinking business seeking expert assistance with network engineering, storage, or virtualization projects? Maybe you're part of an internal IT team that needs to proactively manage, monitor, and secure your technology. We offer comprehensive consulting services tailored to meet your specific requirements. Whether you need fully managed or co-managed IT services, our team is ready to help you. We specialize in supporting businesses that require IT administration or teams seeking an extra layer of support to enhance their operations. Our install team is ready to assist you with all of your structure cabling and Wi-Fi planning needs as well. To learn more about any of our services, head over to lawrencesystems.com, fill out the Hire Us form, and let us start crafting the perfect IT solution for you. If you want to show some extra love for our channel, check out our swag store with shirts, hats, dust accessories, and more. We also have affiliate links down below that will get you discounts and deals on products and services we talk about on this channel. With the ad read out of the way, let's get you back to the content that you came here for. Now I want to start here at rustdesk.com, their official site, and talk about how their business model works. They have a fully open source client and open source server that you can self-host, and we'll be doing that here. But they do also have a pro version, and this helps support the project if you want to license their pro version. Their pricing is very clear. It's up front if you would like to do that. Now, what does pro get you? A little bit more features in terms of web console, access controls, some centralized settings and distributed relay servers. Things if you're just self-hosting it for your own use, you don't really need. But if you wanted to use this for a business, that's where they're targeting that. So that web console system is extra. It's not something we're going to be doing in this video because, well, it does require a license. But after looking at it, I did kind of think about maybe I want to play with it a little more and maybe I'll buy a license and go over that sometime. But back to the product itself, I actually will also say up front here, and I did a little reading on this. I've looked at how they do everything. It's very open. It's very transparent. But there is currently no published code review that I've seen. It's open source, so anyone can look at the code, but I'm just talking about going through a code audit. This is something I have brought up in the past when people have asked me about Rust Desk, and I said, well, I hope at some point it can go through some thorough code review, application pen testing. Uh, there is not anything published on that at the moment, and that's where I want to start is at security. Probably self hostness is not a big deal because, one, it's kept behind a firewall if you're doing it the way I'm doing it. And it is using standard encryption. They didn't roll their own encryption. They're using standard encryption keys. So there's not any reinvention, so to speak, of complexity where they use standardized ways of doing communication. So the likelihood that there's a flaw in it is a lot lower. Now I want to explain how Rust Test works. When it's running in Docker, there's very little that it's doing other than having all the different hosts that are running Rust Test clients talk to it. We'll show you how to set that up, but I want to explain that there's no web interface for Rust Desk unless you buy their pro version. So it's a very simple Docker install with very little parameters, and it really doesn't have to do much at all other than be essentially like a beacon so all of the devices can talk to each other. It brokers the connection between all of them. All the work is done with the client software that you load on all of the clients. And there's not a concept really of server client when you're setting this up. When I run Rust Desk on my computer, it is the same software that you will run on the other computers. Even though it's cross-platform, I can have a Linux instance on my computer because I run Linux and I can have some Windows machines that I'm connecting to and it'll work perfectly fine. And the reverse is true. Those Windows machines, provided they're all tied to my Rust Desk instance, will be able to talk to my server. There are restrictions and we'll talk about that. It's not like they have carte blanche control just to take over any one system to another system, but it is a different concept that there's no web interface to manage Rust Desk. Everything is being managed via this client software, unless of course you buy the pro version and use all the tooling that they have with it. Now, this is what the client software looks like and these IDs get assigned by the Rust Desk server. The Rust Desk server communicates with all these, knows their IP address of all of them, and it's fine if the Rust Desk server is local on your network or if it's in the cloud somewhere. You want to host it in your own VPS, that works fine. We'll talk about what ports are needed for that. You can also put it on the server side of your network, and you just have to make sure you have the firewall rules that allow just a couple ports for any of the Rust Desk clients to be able to get back to that server. So it doesn't have to be on the public internet to have this work. It will work, of course, over VPN. So if you have two 
site to sites that are connected or you want to run an overlay network, you can tie this to an overlay network as well. There's plenty of options in terms of connectivity. You just have to make sure that they're able to talk to the ports. And when we get to the Docker install, we'll talk about what ports are needed. But each system is assigned these IDs by the Rust desk server. That is its purpose. That's all it's really doing is assigning IDs, keeping track of IP addresses. And it does not know any of the traffic going through. It knows that there are connections, but it doesn't decrypt them at all. Every client is end-to-end -end encrypted, so there's not any data that's going to go through other than my computer connecting to another computer, and that's it. The traffic itself, even if it does pass through in relay mode, is all encrypted, so the Rust Desk instance in Docker doesn't have any visibility into the actual data. It just has encrypted traffic that it's seeing. Now, the way Rust Test works is first, all these systems beacon to Rust Test to get the list and assign those IDs to them. And then when you initiate a connection, it uses tools such as UDP hole punching, look that up, and you can see where it'll go directly. That's always its goal is to try to figure out how to take the computer that's initiated the connection, in this case, my computer, to one of the other clients. Even that's across the internet, however it's getting there, if it's through different firewalls, that's where that UDP hole punching comes in, it tries to establish a connection directly to there to the fastest experience is had. If you use Rust Desk, and you can actually use it and test it on their site, it will also do the same thing where their server will try to do UDP hole punching to get from your computer to one of the Rust Desk clients. In the event that you have a firewall that is too restrictive, it's blocking the facilities needed to do UDP hole punching, it will go into relay mode. But because they're end-to-end -end encrypted, even in relay mode, that means the traffic starts at my computer, goes through the Rust test server, and goes over to one of the endpoints, which does mean you're going to have a little bit less of an experience. And depending on where this Rust test server sits, of course, if it's in the cloud, now it's going to go all the way out and back. Well, in that case, you're going to relay that traffic through. But once again, it's encrypted and not a big deal. Something of note, if you have the Rust test server in a cloud, but you're controlling other computers around your own network, it pretty much always is going to go directly because if this computer and this computer are on the same network, it'll just go directly in the Rust test server, even if it's in the cloud, says, hey, look, they're on the same network and they can talk to each other. So that's going to be the shortest path for them to get there. I want to start here right at the Docker install, but I'll also mention overall, they have good documentation. This really did a great job of helping me better understand Rust Desk, not just how to set it up, but how it works. I did spend some time reading through this. Installing your own server with Docker, they give you the ports needed. Now, I like that they also tell you the ports that aren't needed because if you're not using the pro version, you don't need 21.114 and you also don't need the corresponding ports of 21.118 and 19 can be disabled if you don't need web client support, as in the pro version. So pretty straightforward setup, very little exposure in terms of ports. And I think that's pretty simple. It has two sides to it. We have the HBS server. This is what talks to all the clients, gets them connected and figures out what their IP addresses are and assigns them the IDs. And then the relay server is that fallback. If for some reason a direct connection cannot be established between an initiating host and the client host is going to say, well, we'll just fall back and do the relay service. Now going down here, we can just copy and paste their Docker Compose example. So that's what we're going to do. Now I'm doing this in Debian 12 and I'll assume you already have Docker set up. I've already created a directory called Rust Desk and now we're going to do my compose.yaml file. We're just going to paste in right from their website, their Docker Compose. No changes need to be made. Then we'll run Docker Compose up dash D for detach and it will pull in the latest version and it happens quite fast. Now, one last thing before we leave here, we got to go to the data directory and we need the public key that was created because we have to paste this in to any system that wants to connect to the other ones. You can actually set these up individually without this key, but you can't do the connections without this key. This is a very important piece. And if we do an LS, we'll see the ID underscore ED 25519.pub. And we'll just go ahead and copy this key and save it somewhere because I'm going to paste this in and I'll show you where it goes. From the rest of the site, you click on downloads and it'll bring you to their GitHub page where you can download clients for x86 or ARM. They have Windows, Ubuntu, Mac, Android, Flatpak. And I like that the systems become so popular, Rust Desk in general, that you have this warning, you might be scammed. So yes, scammers have been known to use this as well, just like they've used all the other tools that are out there. Now that they have the application open, you notice at the bottom, it says ready for a faster connection. Please set up your own server. We have our own server set up. We just need to go to the settings. Then we go to network. 
ID relay, and we paste in the IP address to the server. The ID server and the relay server are the same because I'm running it on one Docker host that's all in that one compose file. If you were to customize it or set things up separately, yes, it could be separated out, but for simplicity, we kept it the same. Key, this is that public security key. And if you don't put that in here, you'll get a security error that will tell you there's a key mismatch. So that does need to be in here. And now we can get back over to home and it says ready at the bottom. This means it is talking to the server and now we need to set up some more clients. Now I'm on the console of a virtual machine I have running Windows 11. And once again, you see the ready for faster connection. Please set up your own server. So we gotta do the same things here. We go to settings and we wanna go to networking first and put in the ID server and relay server. I'm gonna leave the key out of this one, so I'm gonna show you what happens when you don't have it, but we will be able to connect to this without a key. The reverse can't happen. This can't initiate a connection out, but I'll show you the error you get when we get there. I also wanna to go to security and I wanna set use permanent password. What this allows you to do is connect and not have to use that one-time password. It'll use a permanent password that I can connect each time. These are all selectable if you wanna change the options on there. This is a convenience factor so I can easily access this without any interaction from this desktop or having to remember what that password was on this setting here. As you may notice that the one-time password is gone, we have an ID and we do say ready here at the bottom. Now I'm gonna go back over to the software on my desktop. And if I start typing, it auto-completes and finds that particular server so we can click connect which then it's gonna bring up asking for that password. And I wanted to go ahead and remember that password I typed in. And now I'm on that system. Now, if we go here to the top, we have a couple extra control options. And one of them is to change it to scale original or scale adaptive. The adaptive makes it a little bit easier, especially if you're doing with screens that are bigger. This one's smaller, so it fits in, but when they're bigger, it kind of does a weird scroll thing. So you can control that, the image quality, quality modes, etc. And this is one that's really interesting. It's got privacy mode one and mode two. These are features that you don't always think about unless you're doing a lot of commercial remote support where you are remotely controlling a system, but then someone else could be at that keyboard and maybe you don't want them to be. And it's not just about disabling them. You don't want them to see what you're doing. These are privacy modes that actually blank out the screen. Mode one just puts it on there. This is being remote controlled and mode two actually shuts off the screen. So kind of clever that they put these in. Shows they've been putting some time in to think about solid use cases for these. Now, when we click over here, we have the option to set the OS password, send clipboard keystrokes, transfer files, TCP tunneling. This is actually really interesting because it offers the ability to do port forwarding over this. So if you're dealing with a remote system and you want to be able to forward ports, it's an option in here. If you're familiar with how SSH port forwarding works, this works much the same way. There's also the ability to restart the remote device block user input or switch sides. When we click switch sides, I'll show you what the key error looks like. Because that public key is needed and this particular system doesn't have it, it's unable to make a connection back to my system. And that is under the settings, networking, and no key being here. I like this kind of as a safety feature. If I have it in my system, but no other system has it, there's no chance of any other system reversing the connection to get to me. I think it's cool they have the ability to switch who controls who. So if you're working with someone and they want to take control over yours, you have to initiate it and give them control and they would have to initiate it back. But that is novel that it has that feature. But if you don't put these public keys in right here, it doesn't work. Now it does install itself as a service in Windows. So you can restart the Windows system, get back to the login screen when it reboots and log back in. I think that's great. It's not like you have to have the person log in and then it starts back up as a user application. It is installing as a system service, so it's available on boot. I also tried this on some Linux systems. It seemed buggy when I was using virtual Linux systems, trying to connect to them, but I'm running Linux on my desktop and I had no problems using it to connect to the Windows servers that I was connecting to, such as the one I used an example, and I connected to real desktops and that didn't seem to have a problem. I did give it a go on my Raspberry Pi and Raspberry Pi, the setup I had on it was running Wayland and it turns out there's problems running Wayland if you're using that as your desktop. So yeah, that apparently is in beta right now and uh, beta mint, it worked because I could control the mouse and keyboard, but it 
wouldn't display anything, which I thought was kind of weird. So you could see it moving the mouse, but it wouldn't actually show me the screen on my side. But it does say beta, so I'll give them that. And there's still development being done. It's a very active project. And hey, hats off to them having this whole open source thing that we can self-host. Now, I'm just using this internally. I'm not publicly exposing it. I keep things behind a VPN. It is up to you if you trust their security or not. I didn't see any official posted here in February 2025 full application pen testing report, or if one had been done, I I know that's not absolutely a guarantee that there won't be any flaws found, but it does give you a little bit more comfort when it's gone through some type of high level review. But this is not common with open source projects because, well, an application test like that can run well over $100,000. And that sometimes is hard for a small project to afford, but just make sure people are aware that it hasn't gone through it. And yes, I'll fully accept that commercial products that I've used have gone through testing and still pretty egregious flaws have been found in them later. I know it's not an answer to everything, but security is hard. It always makes you feel better when more people look at it. But the fact that it's open source means it's available for a lot of people to look at. And as I said earlier, they didn't try and roll their own crypto. They're using what appears to be standard cryptography awesome. And they do end-to-end -end encryption. That's great. So I think it's been around long enough that hopefully it's somewhat vetted out there, but ultimately leave that up to you. I'll leave those thoughts and comments down below if you're fine publicly hosting this. Head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com to have a more in-depth discussion about this and other topics. Like and subscribe to see more content from the channel and connect with me on the socials over at lawrencesystems.com. All right, and thanks. Lawrence Systems thanks our sponsors for their support.